Hello, everyone. Welcome to another awesome day of FileMaker training. I'm here at your Carlton. I'm here with Christian Olson. Hello, Christian. How are you? Doing great. Hey, everybody. Hey. Well, nice to be back. Welcome, welcome, welcome. So it's another awesome day here in the world of uh, FileMaker. Today's topic is on the telepathic unicorn. Uh, it's not so much a technical conversation. For those of you who are looking for a deep dive in how to use the latest Git function with the thingy, with the thingy, with the API hook and the Kyle Williams backslash uh, thingy, then yeah, no, that's a different conversation. Um, today is about a conversation I expect some help with some from some of you who have the relevant experience uh, who've been around the block for a while it's mostly getting in front of your customers whether you're an in-house developer or you're an outside developer getting in front of your customers and kind of um, using your telepathic capabilities you know doo -doo 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 -doo, from your head to read their minds and to understand what the hell they're doing even though their lips are not saying because uh, their lips and their facial expressions may not tell you really what they're thinking, right? And so uh, it takes time to be able to build this skill set, uh, but it's it's an important skill set to have because if you want to have a happy customer at the end, you have to understand that what they tell you and what they want sometimes are two different things and sometimes frequently in conflict with each other, right? So that's a very, very important thing. So, oh my God, yes, please package the telepathic unicorns in the wolf pack. So yeah, let's get on topic with that. So real quick, as a uh, for the upcoming information, let me uh, run a couple things by everyone here. I'm gonna I'm gonna leave the Claire shenanigans to the side uh, and focus on uh, immediate, more immediate things. So the upcoming broadcast schedule is right here. Uh, so today is telepathic unicorns. It was originally a topic I did with Garrett Debsky three years ago. Um, and so we're kind of retreading this conversation today. Tomorrow is uh, Nick Hunter. Went Thursday's Nick Hunter. Then Friday is um, interesting conversation. We're going to be talking about Claris's new sales promotion, <clears throat> uh, the Problem Solver Circle, which is interesting because it's supposed to ship today, but I don't know it's actually going to ship because I don't think it's done and functional. Um, there was some serious concerns about them getting it done on time. And so uh, it hasn't shipped yet. It's supposed to ship today, so we'll see what happens on that. Um, then Monday next week, we've got Nick Hunter, and then we're going to be having a conversation next Tuesday next week. Just as a reminder, very, very, very important, we're going to be doing a deep dive on FM Starting Point, the FM Starting Point light. So if you, let me see, do I have a button that goes there? Uh, let me see. Oh, there's a button for FM Starting Point. It works. There it is. So if you go to fmstartingpoint.com, uh, or I put this over here, we can show Christian. You can download the beta by coming here, and this will give you the new Neomorphism Design version. This one right here gives us all the previous version. This gives you the Neomorphism Designs beta. Um, it's really great software, and Christian's team has worked on it quite a bit, right? So... Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So all sorts of conversations. So great. So uh, so this is the, the hot new thing that's out right now. It's totally free. It's totally unlocked. Um, and what we're going to do is that we are going to be doing a 30-day uh, stream on this deal. If I go to the CMS in here, I'm going to open this up, take a look at the upcoming live uh, stream schedule. This is the internal system that we use that drives those uh, DAPI pages. And so starting up here on May uh, 16th is the 30-day on the CRMs, the deep dive. It's for beginners. Um, towards the end of it, it'll be a little bit more advanced. So if you're the kind of person that really digs the really advanced stuff that Nick's doing, this is the anti-Nick live stream. It's the, uh, the basics of understanding and customizing a CRM. It's for brand new people. Um, and we will your, be... Your guest looks like a rock star on there, though. Yeah, he does. He's pretty sharp. That's Michael. Uh, it'll be myself and Michael, probably Calvin a little bit, probably Christian will show up a little bit, too. It runs for 30 days. Uh, it runs all the way through... And then that runs all the way through the middle of June, and we get to day basically 22, which is 22 business days or 30 calendar days. So that's pretty exciting. That's coming up. We will send a notification out to everyone on that. There's a lot of actually really interesting things that are going on, just at, with RCC, if nothing else. So let's talk about 
telepathic unicorn. So really when you're dealing with customers in or whether you're in-house or out-of-house developer and you're building solutions, you need to kind of read their minds. So it's the idea of having a telepathic unicorn, right? And I say telepathic unicorn kind of flippant. But at the end of the day, you have to be able to read people's minds. So, Christian, I want to kind of bring you in here. I also want to bring in the Discord conversation uh, because people are going to have comments or thoughts or questions about that. And, of course, there's Betty White uh, channeling Alf, right, which ate cats uh, was his primary meal. He uh, ate kitty cats. That was what he did. So, yeah, so... uh, China Channel, understand what your customers are doing. So, Christian, let's talk about this. So, what you've got your punch list there still, I'm assuming, uh, somewhere. Uh, let's talk about that. So, what are the what are the concerns or processes about this in terms of? Uh, yeah, well, first I want to build a little background. I'll follow up with yeah. some of the stuff that you were saying there, and and I want to throw this out even initially. Uh, I'll probably bring it up again later in the conversation. But if you have an experience um, where you feel like you read someone's mind and it was helpful to a project, or the lack of reading someone's mind caused an issue. By all means, share those there. I think today's stream is to help all of us learn because the reality is none of us can just come to this with Betty White skill to look into this magic ball and see what, what's going on. And in fact, I think the newer the engineer you are, the analogy that I always like to give with our, our, our newest people is they would love a customer to come to them and say, I need a bridge. I need it to go from here to here. I want it to be this tall and I want it to be this color. And it's difficult when your customer is not able to articulate to you exactly that. And what I've learned over the years is part of the reason that clients don't articulate it to you that way is they don't 100% know what they want. And where it gets really difficult is where the customer does tell you what you want, uh, what they want, but you have the foresight and experience to realize that they might not know as exactly what they want. And so there's uh, some designers out there that influenced me some time ago to really change my thought process from, I like to solve problems. This has always been my, my what I've said as myself an engineer, I like to solve problems, but rather when I'm doing my job the best, I, I'm good at defining problems. And what that has to do with is reading your customer's mind. And so I think there's a few things that kind of go into this because I can't start a meeting with a brand new person and have that forethought to know exactly that. It, it's difficult to do. So one of the things you need to start off with is building a relationship. In, the be- in every first meeting I have with any client that I have, I always express to them, think of me like a new employee at your organization. I'm not very familiar with taxes, like my tax guy who hired me. I'm not necessarily familiar with the medical field, like uh, the people I have that uh, inspect medical equipment. I'm not necessarily familiar with the breeding of sheep, like I had some clients in, in Australia that did things like like that. These are all things that are new to me and I need to understand them. And so building that relationship is important because it also gives you rapport with the client, which can be useful in a number of ways that we'll talk about. The next thing that you really need to do is um, make sure that your listening skills are really good. And listening is going to be more loosely kind of defined today because there's listening to what someone has. But then there's also a professor that I had in college And I think of this example myself all the time. It's actually one of the examples I have at the very end here, where he would look at all of us in the classroom and kind of ask, do you guys get what I'm talking about? And he'd squint his eyes and he would just scan the classroom and kind of go, it kind of go, you guys don't get it yet. And so it's important to actually read what someone is saying, not just the words they tell you. The other thing that I think is really important, this is actually caring. Uh, if, you, if you just want to listen to someone, but you don't really care what the outcome of their project is or what they get, then reading their mind is going to be very difficult because you're not going to see things from their perspective. And another thing, and this is probably one of the hardest, is accepting when you're wrong. And so we have a video that we share internally with everybody called Making Apps That Don't Suck. And I remember when, when Richard shared this with me and I watched this on a, a You Saturday. want me to go get that? You want me to go? You keep talking. Let me go get that for everyone. Okay? By all means, share this. It's a really good app and or excuse me, a really good video. And it, it's something that I like to rewatch occasionally because as Dave Henderson said, one, an engineer who retired from RCC, I think last year was the first or second time he retired. Uh, sometimes you got to eat some humble pie. And so an example that happened to me last year is I designed a new uh, layout for a module that existed for one of my clients. And the best way that I can describe this is it was my Mona Lisa. I was so proud of it and they liked it too. Um, But they wanted to make slight changes to it. 
And to me, it was tantamount of taking a Sharpie and drawing eyebrows on the Mona Lisa, and I cringed at it. Um, but I've also had other times where I've built something for someone, and it makes perfect sense to me, and I think it's great, and either my client or one of my testers goes through it, and it's not as great to them. And my initial reaction is, let me train you how it works. Let me, let me show you why this is great. And, and sometimes you actually have to take a step back. And again, if you listen and you care and you have this relationship with someone to realize that, that you've actually made a mistake here. So I've got a few examples that we can kind of dive into that I think are useful in, if you will, kind of reading your customer minds or helping to navigate these difficult examples. Um, but by all means, Richard, you jump in and if people have examples, like this is supposed to be more of an open discourse. Yeah, um, right now I'm trying to find the uh, Making Apps That Don't Suck video. It's one of the most educational videos. It's great. It's fantastic. So let me get that for you. One little, this is off topic, but the reason you shared that video with us that sticks out to me this day, it's a conversation I have, I don't want to say monthly, but pretty regularly with clients, is uh, custom dialogues that come up. And basically what that app points out, as I've learned to be very true, is uh, custom people don't read those. So if you have something that's really important and you're trying to present to somebody their choice with a custom dialogue, uh, well, just be prepared that it it, it just it never works. I have a client, we re we re we change the language of their custom dialogue all the time because they don't they, they find it to be very confusing. And the custom dialogue says exactly what they need. The, the reality is the custom dialogue just, in my experience, don't work other than to maybe stop someone from doing something that cannot be reversed and you need to have like a safety on the trigger. But if you're relying on it for people to make good choices, it reminds me of when I was a teenager and the Windows computers in the school would come up and say, you've done an illegal action or you need to do an update. And I think 100% of the time, all I ever saw people do was hit cancel and close that window because they didn't know what that meant and they just moved away from it. But one of the main examples I have for reading someone's mind, and I think that this is probably the top one, it's, it's why at the, the top of my list, um, but something that will never happen. So when I was a new engineer, and I, and I was told about this topic, but I learned through it as experience, I think many others are, you'll, you'll come to certain design decisions and you might ask your client, hey, will this scenario ever happen? And your client will say to you, that will never happen. And so you make a design based on the assumption that this one scenario will never happen. And that's a really bad idea. So one of the things that I have learned, and some of my clients joke about it, so I ask clients that, and when they say it'll never happen, in the back of my head I go, one day this will happen. What do we do when that ha when that situation comes up? And so I have clients all the time, they joke about it. They're like, well, I told you it wasn't going to happen, but I bet you you have a strategy for it because you never really believe me when I tell you that. And this is really vital. It's hard to do in every situation, but clients are going to tell you that they don't think it's gonna, something is going to happen because they don't think it's going to happen. Um, I've actually had a client tell me something's not going to happen, and within the month, they realize they were wrong. Um, and so I'm always trying to strategize of what do we do in those situations and try not to code myself into a corner so that I have some remedial actions to get out of it. That, that one, I think, is actually really important. And, and here's the reality, too, as I kind of indicated there. It's, it's not that people are lying to you. Uh, they can't predict the future any better than we can. And if anything, we're better at it because we've worked on a number of databases and we have an idea of what, what is likely to come down the road. Um, the next topic I have in here is understanding what they need, not what they say they need. So to use the bridge example, um, I think there are situations in which someone will try to explain to you, you know, what their problem is and how they want to solve it. And going back to that designer that I mentioned, I think he worked at Apple. Um, he had said, you know, if you're doing your job right, you're not solving problems so much as you're, de you're defining them. And what that and what he follows that up with is that most clients you deal with, they're pretty good at articulating to you what their pain point is. They understand that they have a problem. Um, but this might be shocking. They're not database engineers. And so when they think that they know the solution, they might be telling you it as best as they understand it to be. Uh, but like a lead that I had recently really didn't know, do we separate something into two different tables, two different files, or do we create a type field? At least he had the wherewithal to understand that there were different ways to do it and basically said to me, look, I don't know what the best way is. You probably know better than I am. Um, 
Da, 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 da. And so that's why it's important for us as, as the engineers to actually kind of ask more questions about why do we want to do it this way? The other thing is that there might be an easier way to solve um, something that somebody is doing. This has actually come about more often when someone comes to me and says, I have this issue and this is what I need to do to solve it, but X, Y, and Z isn't working. And I've gone into coaching sessions with someone to try to solve a thing that wasn't working for them and beat my own head into a wall only to realize that everything that led us up to that point maybe had some faults in and of its own. And so understanding like, okay, if you, if you use the bridge example, where, where are we and where are we trying to get to is, are we actually connecting these points correctly? And that's kind of our job to use the, the experience that we have to figure out what is the best way to do that. Um, da, 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 da. And so redefining a problem can very often make a solution much easier. So if you're struggling to find the solution, sometimes it's good to go back and just think if that problem itself can't be def uh, redefined. And keeping in mind that you know clients very well are doing their best to tell you what they think that they need. But again, as much as I'm not an expert in the tax field, my tax guy realizes he's not an expert in the database uh, industry, and we work together to kind of solve that that conflict. Um, okay, warning. let me take a oh, breath. Jump in, jump take in. a breath. Take a breath. Get a drink. Take a breath, get a drink. So I found the video. It had been inadvertently privated. And it's, so this is a recording that RCC made internally. So let me, uh, for those of you wondering. So there's a, I posted it to Discord, Twitch, and YouTube. We are broadcasting uh, simultaneously. So uh, it's right here. If I push the button, it will come up. And you can probably actually hear this, right? So, which is great. Um so this is a recording that we made here, and this is from 2011, 10 years, Hi, 11 ago. So this, this guy right here, fantastic. Again, I am Mike Lee, and I am here to talk about making apps that don't suck. So what he talks about here, none of this has changed in 11 years, 12 years, not the single thing. He built a startup that Apple bought out. It was a very simple little game, but it's there's some really great educational uh, stuff with this. So, uh, in fact, I was looking at this, and Kyle Williams here, of all people who had watched it 11 months ago, so we've talked about this before. The reason it's useful to talk about this again is because these are there's this video, and then the other one you have on design that you have. And, and Shaking the decision, decision tree? He, nah, it was the one where remember the door like going through the door like right hand left hand doors and the handles on the doors is that the same one we're talking about oh the doors that you push or pull and it's the opposite yeah and it just breaks kind of so there's some great training and the problem with everything that we do we leave we live such busy lives that we tend to forget this stuff so sometimes it's good to have a video or some sort of educational component that you can uh, replay and remind yourself of, of the important things in life, right? So remembering, you know, something esoteric and FileMaker maybe not so important, but remembering how to make an app that doesn't suck, remembering how to interact with your customers um, so you get the give them the best possible product I think is really, really important. So yeah, this one right here. Uh, there it is. There's the uh, yeah. And so it's this deal right here. So uh, so there's two videos here. I highly highly recommend that you watch. Um, and what I did is they were captured. At least the one up here with Mike Lee was captured. Mike Lee is primarily in education, and I think he's working. I don't know if he's still in Europe right now. He kind of relocated to uh, Denmark or some place over there, and uh, was uh, trying to work on education and helping things with that. So but yeah, this is a I don't want to say a homework assignment, but you will be happy that you watch these videos. I think they really help get your brain uh, uh, well lubricate lubricate your brain a little bit, right? So there we go. And and the door one there that I posted, it's pretty short. I think at most it's like five minutes. It's actually pretty funny. And the the designer that I've been referencing, who says you you know she better define versus problem solve. He's he's actually the, there. Those are referred to as Norman doors. That's the designer. I found this video some years ago. I don't even remember how, and it interested me so much. I, I looked into the designer, and he's got TED talks and other things where he talks about different things. He worked at Apple. A friend of mine actually worked with him there, um, and it just it's very insightful. But that one's short. It's funny, but I think you can still get a, a lot a uh, lot out of it. Um, da, 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 da. So so jumping on to the next bullet point I had here. Um, and again, so reading their minds, I think I, I, a lot of the topics I have here are a little bit broad. Um, and this one is warning customers who want too much. 
so sometimes people come into FileMaker. I mean, I'm definitely one of them and with wide eyes, like look at everything you can do. One of the issues sometimes I'll have with clients is we start working in too many directions at once. And so we get a lot done, but nothing completed. And you spend all this money and all of a sudden it's hard to see what's what's actually been uh, accomplished. So one of the things I do in coaching is actually a big one of this. I like to come out of every coaching session with some sort of win. And so sometimes a client will come to me with different things and I can tell we're not getting anywhere. I'm like, let's go knock a couple things off the list. But the other thing is that I refer to people is I don't like to have too many untied shoes, if you will. That is if I have too many projects that are not completed, it starts to become overwhelming. And so when I have customers who want a lot of things, it's my job to help us actually organize those and put those uh, uh, into a coherent uh, uh, order and also so that they can see those wins. Because if you spend $50,000 and it's hard to see much accomplishment, uh, you don't have that ROI and it's hard to continue to do things. But so for, for myself, when I work on projects with Calvin, sorry, I just saw the Area 51 there. Um, when I work with projects like Calvin, for us, it's always like, okay, we need to get like a big win for the client early, something where they start using the solution and get into it because then they're going to be invested into the project. And, you know, I, this can actually apply to the people that have too many things going on and then they themselves can become overwhelmed at the veracity of the project itself. And I've actually had projects where the person pauses work just because they themselves are overwhelmed. And it's my job to try to anticipate that this person is digging themselves a hole that they're not gonna know what to do of do with once they get inside of it. Um, so that one's kind of an interesting, we have another warning one that we'll get to here in a little bit. Um, this one, <laughs> I don't know if it fits into the, the mind reading, but it's always worth bringing up. Uh, they will not bug test. Uh, if you're depending on your client to bug test, there's a few of them that might, overwhelmingly, they will not bug test. They will tell you that they will bug test, they will not bug test. The other thing that I've actually had happen with clients is they get aggravated with bug testing. I had one client who got really frustrated with this because we got together and I was so used to people, I'm like, all right, we're gonna get together, something's not gonna work, and over the next few hours, we're gonna kind of fine tune it. And I didn't read that customer well enough. And very, very early in that meeting, he became very frustrated and basically said to me that what I built for him didn't work and he was upset. And what I could have done to anticipate that is realize that this is not somebody who does what all my other clients do. I need to find other ways to test it before I come to him because he's gonna be aggravated and actually throw that portion of the project away or throw me and the project entirely away. Um, so understanding that. So some of the suggestions I would actually throw out in regards to this is find people to test for you. You might have heard me say earlier, my testers. And so a couple things here that we've talked about, I know at other streams, our mistakes are invisible to us. They just are. And you'll build something and you, and you test it to completion and you see that it works, but then it's very hard to test the nulls, the things that would cause it to break. But as you get more experience, you know that you need to try to break it but we still just don't do certain things if we're the ones that designed it. So I like to get other engineers at the company to come in and test the work that I do, and conversely, I'll test the work that they do. But I also really like having layman's that can test my work. Um, I don't do it a whole lot, uh, but my, my girlfriend is technologically illiterate, is the way that I would put it. And so I've had ner certain new features that I built for clients that have a lot of like layman users, if you will. And uh, in those situations, I'll actually have her come and use it because she'll get very confused. Um, but if I can get her to use it without any issue, um, then I know that anybody else can come in and, and use that. Sorry, I was getting distracted by the, uh, the dog there for a moment. So, so Christian, Christian took his dog to work today and I'm not there to feed the dog hot dogs. The dog is a total snack hound, right? Yes. So. Yeah, and we've got engineers on vacation. He's he's actually been really sad that his friends aren't here today. So. Ah, okay. <laughs> so yeah, so finding somebody around you that maybe isn't all that savvy with technology is actually really, really useful. In that one situation, my client had people that don't use the database often and just really were not tech savvy. And so I got Danny to come over and I showed her this new cool thing I built and I didn't say anything. I'm like, just walk through it. 
You know, you'll see it in, I think it's the making apps that don't stuck. He's, he explains the essence of Apple. And one of those things is discoverability. Apple doesn't have instructions. You sit down and you just figure out how it works. And I hope that she could do that. And I saw her get stuck on points. And that's where, again, I had to accept that sometimes I'm wrong. And the stuff that I thought was so perfect and perfectly designed, it wasn't. And I had to eat a little humble pie and think about how do I redesign this so that somebody not me can look at it and just figure out where to go from there. Um, and that really can um, improve, uh, improve a process quite a bit because some people are very sensitive to bug testing. I have, I have a lot of my clients that are actually very tolerant and they understand the process of building things and things will not work on step one. But I've had other clients who their tolerance level is extremely low. And so that's where you have to try to read your clients and know where they're at with it. Are they gonna work with you to fix those bugs? Or are they going to think that you basically done them a disservice and why should they pay for something that doesn't work? Yeah, that's that's a good one. Um, yeah, so the uh, the issue with the bug testing is, is you know, and you run into some consultancies that are like, hey, we have a dedicated bug testing team and this whole thing. And you can have that, but then your customer has to want to pay for that. And um, a lot of times they say, we want bug testing. And, you know, and they're, and they're going to pay a hundred and whatever dollars an hour for a, an engineer developer. Well, the developer works five hours on the project and then there's, say, a couple hours of bug testing in there or whatever it is. Um, well, I don't want to pay for bug testing. It should work perfectly the first time. Oh, my God. Educational moment time, right? You have to explain to people that is a fundamental of software development. It doesn't work the first time perfectly. Um, it should kind of loosely work, right? It should, because the engineer should have pushed the buttons to verify, you know, functionality, but they are blind. You're never going to see your own faults. And so they're like, well, it should work the first time. I shouldn't have to pay for testing. How do you handle that kind of conversation, Christian? And, you know, I'm glad that you mentioned that. This wasn't on my list, but setting expectations, it, it goes a long, long ways. And so early on in my projects, I'm, I'm, I actually totally blanked on this in my list. Uh, I'm glad you brought it up, Richard, is I very specifically in writing tell people you should expect bugs not not only will they be in there they're a normal part of the process and um i will like to get things in writing i don't necessarily like to get things in writing uh to go and like rub it in someone's face um, but this is actually my list later getting things in writing does a, a variety of things for you number one when you present something to somebody in writing very specifically in some ways they have to acknowledge it um, the second thing is yes you can go back and you can reference it to them um, but I, I think that first part of just getting them to acknowledge it so setting expectations is is huge and that's another part of reading people's minds if you can sense that someone's asking for too, something too much or they're going to be very sensitive to bugs or whatever their uh, thing is going to be getting ahead of it is is really useful um, when I was in high school I did debate and one of the best things that you can do in debate politicians use this if you have a weakness bring it up yourself don't wait for the other side to attack you with it immediately bring it up um, if you're selling a vehicle this is kind of off this uh, off uh, off topic but same kind of thing and you know that there's an issue with your vehicle bring it up right up front so that somebody's not going to try to beat you up with it. So if I have something that I'm going into with a client where I think it's going to take a lot of time or not going to meet a deadline or they're going to experience some hiccups, I try to very clearly communicate that to them. Um, I had a big rollout Mon Friday of last week with a client and leading up to that, I became very concerned about our deadline because they were changing things. And so I had to communicate to them, hey, I'm getting worried about some of these changes affecting our rollout. I'm concerned that this is going to cause things not to work. And that could help protect me because they're more willing to maybe roll some of those things back or not push on it because I'm telling them as loud as I, as I, as I put it to them, it's my job to be the little warning light on your dash uh, that something bad is coming ahead. So I think setting expectations is one of the best things that you can do for that. Um, and, and that actually leads me into the next topic pretty well, which is listen for deadlines and budget shortages. So if you're if someone says um, 
uh, you can see further ahead. You can you can see further ahead than other people might be able to see themselves. And so if you start to hear this deadline, like we got to roll DocuSign out, a web integration, the two have to talk. Um, you need to be aware if there is a deadline issue there and not just hope that it's all going to work out for the best. It's important that as early and often you start to communicate to someone, I have concerns about this deadline. But just as important and maybe sometimes more important is budget issues. If you start to get the murmurs that there's not enough budget for something, as early as you can bring it up. Um, I do this early on in projects where someone is indicating to me, like if I tell someone at kind of a lower end best guess on something and I can hear them hemming and hawing, one of the things I will often tell someone before I do any work is that the cheapest thing I've ever built is $5,000. And if you're not prepared to spend at least $5,000, I don't think that this is a good path to go down. And that can also be true for a project with a long-term client. I have clients that ask me for things and I'll say, hey, I just want you to know, I think this is gonna take me at least several weeks. Clients really appreciate that, rather in the middle of something after they've spent time and money to, and they go, hey, is this almost done? Like. I'm kind of run out of budget for this. And you go, I don't know, we're like 20% of the way there. And they're like, well, if I had known that, I wouldn't even spent the money. So you're protecting yourself and you're also making the client happy. Um, I've had a number of clients thank me for telling them like, I don't think we're gonna make that deadline or I don't think we, th this is gonna cost what you think it is. Um, and, the, and the reality is we have a better idea of what that is. But I think that especially if you're a newer engineer, you're so afraid to say no to a customer or push back on somebody and you really want the work that you're willing to take on risks that you shouldn't do. And, and those just don't typically bode well for yourself. And so you again, that's where that kind of reading the customer, yes, I understand that you want this, but I'm worried about these things. The other thing that it does is it expresses your value. So if you, if someone says they want something and you go, I don't think it's gonna be for the cost that you want, is that worth it to you? They can express it to you. There, there's an item that I have that we're gonna come up to later. And I guess I'll go ahead and just mention it now. Um, and, and then I think this falls under my, my second warning section, but this is if a client asks me for something and I either don't, don't wanna do it or I'm concerned that it's gonna cost a lot of money. There's a few different things that I'll, I'll express to them. And an analogy my clients have heard me say many times is, hey, um, Steve, uh, I very much love to solve problems. That's what my job is. And the problem that you presented is a tricky one and I would love to solve it, but you're the one that has to pay for me to solve it. Um, do you think that this thing is worth the time it's gonna take me to solve it? Because it's gonna take me a considerable amount of time. Um, and I'll do that again if I know that there's an alternate way to do something and I don't really wanna do the other option, I can help steer them away from it. I also do this for things that I actually really wanna do, but I realize it's gonna take a whole bunch of time and it might not be the best option for that. And people really appreciate that has been my experience. Um, scrolling back <laughs> back up on there, um, I think the next item, and this goes, all, all these things kind of fit into the building the relationship, listening, caring, knowing when you're wrong, and, and that's to know your customers. Um, your customers will ask for things uh, they don't like, um, and I will actually try to dissuade them from those bad choices. I wish I could come up with a specific example right now, but one of my main clients has asked me for several things that I know that he wouldn't like if I actually built. And so I try to spell out what it is that he's asking me for. Um, some of your clients, you'll learn, count the number of clicks that they do. They count the number of screens that come up, um, or they don't. Some clients are like, who cares if I have to click three times? So, so knowing your customer and what those things are. So if a customer asks me something where I know that this is about to add three different clicks to them, I might say, hey, are you sure you wanna do that, Scott? Cause like if we do this, all of a sudden you're gonna have to click this, this, and this, and they'll go, oh, you know what? I hate when I have to click on all those things. Christian, do you think there's a different way for me to do it? Um, and then offer that, that alternative to them or Sometimes clients will ask me things and I don't 100% know what the solution is. And so I will have a column of what I call conversation pieces where we kind of get together and chat this out to figure out like what's gonna be the best way to do it or maybe build a skeleton idea of it so we can kind of uh, um, tinker around with it. Um, 
And, and that kind of goes into another topic too of acknowledging when you don't know something. Um, so if a client asks for something and you're a little unsure about it, it's okay to tell someone like, I don't know. Um, my first year in coaching, that petrified me. And I got all kinds of super weird questions that if I got today, I wouldn't feel all that uncomfortable to say, you know, I don't know the answer to this, but I can go try to figure it out for you. I'm gonna take a little breath there. <laughs> That was, uh, that, was a, that was a lot. I'm, I'm sitting here drinking on a drink and having a protein bar. And that's a good that, – those are good. Those are really, really good. So – and this gets back to something else, and I, I'll bring this up briefly with people here. Uh, I do have your notes up. I'm going to hide my – and show myself briefly. So – and it's – I'd be interested in other people's experience with this. <clears throat> After doing this for 30-some-odd years, whatever it is, um, sometimes you have a situation – where it's not like uh, you have a situation where you know what's going to happen and the, and you've warned the person it's going to happen and they were really absolute about it. And I have two examples. They're not so much coding examples, but they're both related to the FileMaker platform. So we had a, an example, and this is back in the old days, and it could still happen today, but I, I don't think so much anymore. The FileMaker server product's pretty stable. But we had a server room. It was on a bunch of on-premise servers. This was 90, 98, uh, about uh, 23 years ago. From a, stru from, a stru from a structural strategic idea, there was still FileMaker Pro, Mac, and Windows. You had FileMaker Server. The servers were on Windows servers for the most part. This was before Go, Go it in it existed. But if you think about the product, really, it was the same <laughs> product, right? And and so we had we had this data center, this room with servers in it. And there was like 20 servers in this room. And there's all the way around on racks. And it was air conditioning in there. And the database people that were working there, there was like 12 database people. That's how big of an operation this was. This che company chewed through millions, millions and millions of dollars every year in database work for Cisco, PeopleSoft, Oracle, Sun Microsystems, uh, that kind of stuff. And they, uh, the problem was that the d developers would go in there and they would put a plug-in on a server, or do something like that, and they brought in a new CIO. He thought he was uh, pretty smart. He was an older guy, former military. One of those deals in the military where if I say R, uh, R E M F, right, uh, uh, kind of stuff. So he wasn't a shooter, and so he was kind of a bureaucrat. And so what happened was is that he came up with this rule that if any of the database people, they had IT people that would maintain the servers, but they didn't really know FileMaker. Um, but if any database person went in the server room, they would be fired because they were really tired of this problem and they were very explicit about it. And there were no, there were no like carve outs for when maybe this absolute rule wouldn't be absolute because they absolutely threatened to fire everyone. And so, we're sitting there, and the power goes off in the building. The battery backups come on, and the batteries are good for about 15 minutes. And, of course, the IT guys go running around, running around. They go running in there, but there's only three IT guys. There's 20 servers. There's no way they can triage 20 servers, but the, but the people who are more qualified to go in the room are, are threatened to be fired if they go in the room. And so I had this engineer who turned out to be a real weasel, but he sat there, he looks at me, he throws, he literally is in a meeting, he throws his papers up in there and says, we're going to lunch. And he takes the entire sub team that he had, like eight other engineers, Christian, and goes to Starbucks, goes out the door and goes to Starbucks, watching this operation burn to the ground. It wasn't literally on fire. That was the only thing that wasn't on. And I sat there. And I thought about intervening because I was kind of, kind of not. I was below this CIO guy, this bureaucrat, um, but uh, I was also a contractor, and I didn't want to be fired. And so I'm sitting there going, "Well, the the correct answer is to override his thing and allow my people to go in there to help stabilize the patient. The patient's flatlining, beep beep beep, code blue in the ER. Everyone's pumping on the patient, except there's 20 patients and there's three doctors. What the f do you do? And and I sat there and didn't do anything. And um, and it turned out that it probably wasn't the right answer, but you, you your customers are giving you an absolute. And I'm not sure what to do. The other one I had just like this. And this was actually with people that's more modern. The current uh, vice president of sales at Claris, um, 
had a very different opinion of what a, sa a site license was than one of a very large customer, and and they were they had two complete uh, competing opinions of each uh, of what a site license was, and instead of me getting in there and moderating it, because it wasn't even my deal, it wasn't my license deal. I said, hey, how about you two guys just go talk to each other? Well, it's a couple guys uh, who's uh, Mm -mm -mm. They're, you know, they're they they've got the biggest uh, package. I will use the word package loosely in the room. My package is bigger than your package, so you're going to do what I say. And these two people didn't back down, and I I put them in the room together, and what the customer did was fire FileMaker and remove the product from the from the customer, and and because this the Claris employee wouldn't. Uh, back down and so they were fired entirely out of there it actually cost me a customer and so in retrospect I should have played like nego hostage negotiator so if so the question is Christian if you have a really ugly situation at what point do you inject yourself in there to be the hostage negotiator because um, these are two things in retrospect if I could play them back in time they'd look different a little bit I think maybe at what point do you get in the middle because you know the correct answer, you know you're the only one with the correct answer, but somehow you've been, you know, it's not your fight, it's not your it's not your dog in the fight, but you know that if it goes badly, you'll be uh, somehow negatively affected, even though really it's just by collateral damage. It's going to explode and you're going to catch shrapnel from collateral damage, right? So what point do you inject yourself in there? I'd be interested to know that, right? I think that's difficult. I had, I had another bullet point lower on the list that's similar to this. Um, I, I labeled it "Know How to Communicate." Okay, but, here it is, right here. I got it on. Yeah, but yeah. but it reminds me of an example. I'll, I'll actually tell you guys the specific example, and then I can go into my specific bullet points. I had a customer who um, we converted his system over to do lookups. You guys are probably familiar with this. You know, you create an invoice. It looks up the customer's name. It looks up their phone number, and it, it stores it on that invoice because later on someone could get married they could move their phone number could change but that invoice needs to be a record of that time and place but in their business they're doing roofing installations and to him it was more important to have the most current address that he that that they had and if anything changed they wanted everything to change in real time so there's ways to handle this but what he did is he, he basically wanted to have everything look through relationships and this can be okay when you have an invoice looking at the contact record, but as we went deeper and deeper, you started to have grandchildrens, and he eventually wanted to build great grandchildrens, and this is hard. I had another customer, it's hard for me to express exactly what it is, the, the situation, but he wanted me to build something incorrectly. And so you're in this situation where you and the client don't see eye to eye. I talked and to this guy. I talked to this guy. He absolutely insisted that he could build everything with a flat file. I remember this. Well, that's a different one. Oh, okay. I was thinking this happened, of our, this uh, happened more uh, than once. I won't mention. I won't mention it. This happened I, well, more than happened, once. So, it, so this is exactly it. You know, Richard's example might be slightly different than mine, but you have these situations where you don't see it eye to eye to someone, and arguing is dicey. Um, this person at the end of the day is in many ways is your boss. And even if you, I, I have won arguments, but lost the war, if you will. I might've been right, but I pissed everybody off around me about what we were going to do for dinner or where we were going to go see a movie because I'm letting them all know that they're freaking idiots and they don't have any fourth foresight. Um, and I don't ultimately win that. And so one of the best things that you can do on this, that is a challenge is is finding the right way to convey something um, or offer an alternate option um, on what can really be valuable. Now, that's really vague and loose out there, but sometimes people are gonna tell you to do something that's wrong and they're your boss and you might have to just kinda bite your tongue on it a little bit. If you're very concerned, like we're not gonna make backups, send them an email so that you have something in writing. So you're making it very clear to them, like I am concerned about what we're doing and I want you to acknowledge it. Yeah, paper Which trail, is, paper trail. And then, yes, if someone gets really, really upset, you can refer to the paper trail. But really avoiding things ahead of time is the best. And I have actually found that when I send something to somebody in writing saying, hey, you know, we had this situation come up. You've advised me that this is how you want to do it. I believe this to be a bad, a bad idea. And I just want to make sure that you acknowledge that we're doing it the way that you said. 
and that this could result in these things in the future. And I just want to make sure that this is documented. When I have done that, and it's, I don't like to do it often, uh, I can't really think of many places where we've actually done what they proposed. The other thing you can do, and this is also dicey, uh, this is the example you're not necessarily as familiar with, Richard, but it came from one of the videos, is the, the person wanted to have, if I can remember this correctly, he had a products table, he needed to keep inventory for different locations or different businesses, and so I'm like, what we need to do is have a portal and a table, and he said, no, we're just gonna have fields. I was like, well, that's not gonna work for everything that I have to build past this, and he says, I don't care that's what I want, that's what it's going to do. And I'm like, well, I'm the one that has to build everything, and he's making me make a terrible design decision, and he's going to blow up at me when it doesn't work. Um, so, be cautious with this. Um, I made it look exactly like what he asked for, and I did it the correct way behind the scenes. <laughs> okay, okay, yeah, I've had people come to me and they, because they built something in FileMaker 2 or 1 years ago that they would, uh, they would uh, do that. Yeah, so Labo's got a video there. Am I supposed to watch this right uh, now or save it for Somebody just posted later? that video in RCC Slack a couple weeks ago. It's freaking, it's wonderful. <laughs> so when you guys get a chance, definitely watch that. It's very short. It's on product testing. Um, jumping up on the list, too. This, this is a real brief one, but I'll throw it out there. It's something that I do more and more that I didn't used to do, and I'll give a very specific example. I'll have clients that go, I want an automatic email or message that goes out, and I want it to say X, Y, and Z. And a lot of you are probably familiar with this, and I'll say, hey, you know, are you going to ever want to change the message? And they'll say, no, message is pretty much always going to stay the same. And so you can hard code it into the script easily and quickly. One of the things I've started doing now is I almost always just add the, the text box somewhere, like in preferences. And I, I I very frequently had customers who go, you know, Christian, I wasn't going to change the message. And then I saw this little thing and, and I was so great that you gave me that box to go and change it. So um, newer engineer, a newer Christian used to build things fairly rigid. You'd have to hire the engineer to come back in and change it. Now I spend a lot more time to try to put customization into the hands of my client. I always tell them like, hey, why should you pay me twice to do the same thing? Um, the other thing is I would much rather them go change a message than me have to do it. That's boring. Um, and, and it gives them ownership over their product. There's something cool when you get to actually customize and change it yourself. So I think that that does a few different things, whether it's reading people. Well, I guess they're reading their mind is they'll tell you they aren't going to change it, but they do. Okay. Um, I want to play this video right here for everyone. All right, there we go. Let's try this. Here this is a square. Can you guess which spot that goes the in? The square. That's right. It goes in the square hole. Yes. Okay. And how about this rectangle? That one. Also the square. It goes in there too. Yeah. Up next, we've got this thin rectangle. The thin rectangle. Can you guess where that goes? The thin rectangle. That's right. It goes in the square hole. And up next, a cylinder. Hmm. The circle. I think that goes in the circle. The square hole. Now we've also got this semicircle right here. Do you see a slot that would fit the, the semicircle? Semicircle. The, sem the semicircle. That's right. It's the square hole. Okay. <laughs> Up next, the triangle. We know what hole that goes the into, triangle. right? Triangle. That's right. The square hole. And up la up next, we have the arch. The arch. The arch. You guessed it. The arch. It goes in the square oh. hole. <laughs> I, I felt sorry for her. That was that, that would looked rough. So yeah, definitely <laughs> made things. I, that reminds me of the custom dialogues. Actually, I like I'd mentioned before. I have a client. That it'll say something along the lines of like, "Hey, this PO didn't update the invoice. Would you like to go to the invoice to update it?" And they'll be like, "Christian, what does this mean?" Uh, and I'll be like, "Well, it kind of sounds like the PO didn't get updated." They're like, "Or the invoice," and they're like, "Well, what do we do?" I'm like push the button that says to go there. They're like, can we change the wording on this to be a little clearer? So, <laughs> I, I, I feel like building things is a lot of times for, for me, that girl watching someone put a triangle in. Well, she's, she, I, I, obviously that was staged, but that she was a good actress. She actually looked pretty upset. I was like, wow, I feel sorry for her. I'm like, wow. I, I think she was in pain there. I know. She, was, she looked like she was, yeah, I looked uh, really horrible. So, all right, well, that's interesting. So, 
Uh, what else we have? Because uh, we're kind of like got to land the plane here pretty soon. Where yeah, we you at, know, sure. we, we actually kind of hit a lot of these other topics, things like putting in and writing, know how to communicate. The last kind of two things or, or three things, I'd say just briefly here um, is, and this goes back to what I'd said in the very beginning, which is, is get to know your customer. Certain people like or expect certain things, and you should mold yourself as best you can kind of around that customer. And building up rapport helps that because I have a really good relationship with most of my clients. I've, I've had the coaches sitting on calls and they're like why did you talk about barbecues for like 15 minutes and it's like well because we both got the blackstone griddle because they told me about it and then you know and then when mistakes happen too i've got someone who's a little more understanding but i also kind of know what to expect from them and that really helps on this other thing where you ask the questions and kind of like the professor i said where you, you scan the room and you hear them but you really try to to see like hear what they're saying it's kind of like and this might be a bad example um, if your your girlfriend or your parents tell you, yeah, go ahead, go out tonight, uh, they might have said that you can go out tonight, but that's a trap. And so it's important to kind of hear what someone's saying kind of beyond the words. And then, and then I think it comes back to actually the golden rule, which is try to treat people the way that you'd want to be treated. Um, I very much look at myself as a part of all these different companies that I work for, and, and I'm reading their mind to think about if I were this person, if this were my company, if these were, how would I want this to work? And also, how would I want to be treated? I, I have a customer that spent a lot of money on a, on a new feature, but it, it's not done, it's had bugs. And I'm very empathetic to him about how frustrating that might be for how much time and how much money he's put into it. And, and that goes a long way. Um, and so anticipating and getting ahead of things is going to go a lot further than trying to clean up the mess afterwards. So I think that that's my, my takeaway on all that. All right, cool. Well, that's pretty good. Uh, Ruben has a question. So you keep a checklist next to your, to your first conversation with your client. Um, I have, um, I need to find it somewhere. I don't, I don't have new clients very often. So when I do I have to go back and look, but I do have specific questions that I always ask. And then um, if I actually use the, the Apple Notes app where you can actually make the checklist. So yeah, Ruben, I, I, I do that actually. At the beginning of most of my meetings, I even for this stream, I go through and I check things as I go uh, to indicate that I made sure that I, I asked that question, like how many users or this or that. So um, I very much do. I just sometimes have a hard time going and finding it because, um, as I jokingly say to people all the time, I, I can't get rid of my customers. So it's really unusual that I'm I'm talking to somebody new. But I do have a list of questions that I ask all new customers. And then I will try to get some information ahead of our first meeting so that I can add some questions. And I put that in that checklist format so I make sure I check it off as the meeting goes. Okay, cool. All right. Well, any other comments or questions? We've been letting you folks uh, kind of type and go and see your stuff so there we go but yep pretty good stuff so tomorrow nick is back and then we are prepping for the crm live 30-day live event we're going to actively be hitting on that uh with emails here getting people on the schedule good session cam bear thank you yeah appreciate it hey, as uh, long as michael doesn't drown in mexico you're we're good to go uh yeah actually if he doesn't drown in mexico that would be great you know he's uh he's been doing scuba diving taking scuba classes so he's uh Hopefully swims pretty well, but maybe not. We don't know. Um, cool. Schmeagel, thank you. All right, everyone. Well, that's about it for today. If you have any comments or questions, send an email to support RC Consulting. I did do one tech support thing for IT Gaming. Provided him an answer or her an answer uh, for their FileMaker solution. Uh, and then, uh, but they are, if they have a want to follow up, shoot an email to support at rcconsulting.com. All right, everyone. That's it. See ya.
Got a report of an individual up here who uh, may be a FileMaker license. Uh, well, it's potentially expired. Look at the back of that car right there. Looks like the FileMaker license has expired. Sir, I need you to step out of the vehicle. Sir, sir, step out of the vehicle. Sir! 